You are listening to Level Up Your Gaming Podcast, episode 26, Episodic Storytelling. Today we talk about episodic storytelling versus a long chronicle. We discuss some of the benefits of episodic storytelling and why we believe you should try it out. If you'd like to participate in the discussion or leave us feedback, you can contact us at levelupyourgamingpodcast at gmail.com. Also, if you like the show, please subscribe, leave us a review, or tell a friend. Now sit back and enjoy the episode. Welcome to the Level Up Your Gaming Podcast. My name is Aaron, and in his home, he is the master of leaving breadcrumbs for you to follow, Jared. Hey, everyone. Hope you're having a great week, and a happy uh, 4th of July weekend. Uh, it's going to be a little belated. We'll be here on, uh, on Wednesday after the 4th of July, but if you do hear fireworks going off in the background, that would be because we are recording actually on the 4th of July. <laughs> and my neighborhood is celebrating it in full swing. <laughs> so a little uh, a belated happy fourth of july um oh so um aaron how are you doing i'm doing great i'm doing great it's been a nice uh a nice three-day weekend uh or at least the start to a three-day weekend i'm gonna go out hopefully see a couple fireworks we'll see what happens how about yourself doing real good still in the state um thinking about picking up a new laptop uh, for any of our listeners who, uh, this is going to be shocking, like, who are computer guys or gals. Uh, so I'm getting a, a, a new laptop for when I travel so I can, uh, you know, uh, pretty much play video games while I'm on the road because you can't really take a, an Xbox with you. I know there are going to be some listeners who disagree. They're like, oh, just bring it, break it down to its base components. Like, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> You see, I fly, <laughs> and bags get tossed, <laughs> and I'm not sticking an Xbox in my carry-on. But Costco, amazing freaking price. Um, I I couldn't find this laptop for, you know, le- uh, six hundred dollars cheaper than anywhere else that I could find it. It was, it's absolutely blowing my mind, and it it's a very good laptop. I had Aaron review it. I had another coworker review it. And they all agreed to the system requirements. And it was found by my mother. My wow. mother, who is the least tech-savvy person in the world. She was like, well, I was shopping on Costco and heard you were looking for a new computer. Again, maybe not as tech-savvy as you, but certainly good at spotting a deal. So <laughs> Good at spotting a deal. Costco! <laughs> no, we're, we're not sponsored by Costco. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what's the topic for this week, Aaron? Well, the topic for this week uh, is episodic storytelling, hence why I kind of brought in the breadcrumbs theme for this week. Uh, uh, (laughs) Episodic storytelling. So, you know, I I thought about this topic and I was going to start with uh, advantages and disadvantages. So I made a list of advantages and then I tried making a list of disadvantages. Excuse me. Excuse me. Here's the thing. In making my list of disadvantages, I really couldn't find one. Episodic storytelling, mind, please, all of our listeners, please understand, we we started doing episodic storytelling within the last two years. It's actually your brother's suggestion to try it, and I was a little yeah, hesitant to, I was hesitant to try it because we were always trying to build the long campaign. Always trying to build the long campaign, the continuous uh, status, Um, you know, and it's funny because I grew up with long campaigns. I grew up with a storyteller trying to tell one story that was huge that they would sometimes turn into two or three volumes. I built that story that turned into two and three volumes. I've built games that have gone a year and a half and it is always seen as the triumph of a storyteller, like writing a book. And it's funny after three years of storytelling, I can, of episodic storytelling, I can look and tell all of our listeners who are looking to level up their gaming, that is false. That is a myth. It is a myth created by storytellers who have created that game, you know, who did create that, that year and a half campaign, that two year campaign, that five year campaign in which their players loved it. And they think this is the way. The thing is, is I can tell you it's not the only way. You can do it. Go for it. I've done it. I, I have 
I have proudly put several games that I call my flagship games on my mantle, you know, and all of them were long based story campaigns. And it wasn't until recently that it was, I don't know, how long did Red Lake last? The, Red Lake weeks? was probably somewhere between six and eight sessions. And honestly, that game has eclipsed many of what I called my flagship games. That game probably eclipsed many games that you spent, we, we gamed in for years over yeah, those, the mean, course of those games. And it is just, it, it simply um, just blew them all away. So I'm going to tell everyone that you might sit there and think this is long campaigns are what you do hence the term campaign is so integrated into role playing it's almost fused into it what are you doing well we're doing a campaign on this you know not an episode on this not a short story on this you can now take that word and i want you to put that word on where it belongs it does belong on the on the board but i also want you to take the word episode short story um and put those on the board because i want you to start thinking about it now great thing about episodic if you want to start doing it right now you're in the middle of a five-year campaign episodic storytelling does not necessitate does not necessitate that you have to stop your five-year long campaign you can create inside your five-year long campaign an episodic uh story that's self-contained, beginning, middle, end, done, get back to the, the huge campaign. It involves the same characters. You can have it that way. You could have it involve a subset of characters, maybe another group of, of heroes that your uh, players met along the way, or a group of villains. Wouldn't that be a cool little episode? Mm, we're playing the bad guys that we fought, you know, 12 months ago. So episodic, I, I, I sat down and I was like, oh, man, you know, um what are the disadvantages I, I i couldn't find any but i have a lot of advantages and uh, i'm going to try to persuade i guess all of you to try it at least once to give it to give it a shot um so ad advantages in doing an episodic campaign and warning aaron might aaron might stop me and be like hold on we're going to save that for next week but it, it's part of episodic but so everyone get ready for Aaron to put on the break. But episodic storytelling allows you to have new storytellers each and every week, or not each and every week, sorry, each and every story. It welcomes other storytellers into the campaign. And we are going to have an episode, maybe even two, on um, creating a, a community environment. And we'll talk about that in those episodes because that in itself is such a big thing. And we have so many tools for you that you can use. But you can start going around the table. Who else wants to storytell with? Maybe you've got two friends in, in your group that have always wanted to storytell, but they don't know how to make a, a six year campaign. And you're always the storyteller. And we're in the middle of a six year campaign. We can't just put it down now. But having an episodic storytelling uh, capability or option gives your players that option to sit in the driver's seat and maybe storytell a little bit, maybe get their, get their gaming on in, in that fashion. So that's, that's a huge advantage. And I cannot tell you enough how, how much it is for me as a storyteller, because uh, I, I typically do most of the storytelling for the group. But ever since we've gotten to the episodic, I can't say that anymore. I do equal storytelling to Aaron. I would still say that you do more storytelling than all of us. You, your, your episodes tend to last a little bit longer. But at the end of the day, I mean, <clears throat> I've run more games in the last couple of years than I have ever before that. Um, Ken has run, well, I guess Ken has run several games for us. Brian, who never story told. Nevers. Told it, told us, told it, actually jumped into the driver's seat and story told the game. And um, knocked it out the park. He, he had a very, he had a very successful, successful game. And that's something that, that's allowed for episodic gaming. The nice thing about it, um, I think one of the bigger 
things is that you could either share the responsibility with other people at the table who want to story tell. Um, two, it's a lot less pressure to have to produce a reasonably good game in a couple of sessions. Okay, when you were talking about episodic storytelling, you're probably thinking like two to seven game sessions, maybe eight if you're going to push it. Or, and then the other thing that, that you get out of it though is if you have been telling a six year campaign, the problem with the six year campaign is fatigue. Okay. And you, that, that, that's, that's the biggest thing that you're going to run into with telling a long campaign. Uh, well, two, the, the two hardest things is, is getting it off the ground and then keeping the damn thing afloat. Okay. <laughs> you know, well, like I said, it, it, no, go, go on. Oh yeah. Well, well cause I mean like, cause the, that, 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 that's, that's the biggest and hardest thing. Now your players may, may not love the idea of episodic gaming. And I was not open to it as a player um, because I went, well, if I have to tell episodic games, if I have to be, if I'm going to be, be part of it, how am I ever going to be invested in the characters I have? Uh, and our, and our solution to that was to share characters across the episodic games, meaning that each one of these takes place in the same timeline and you're basically picking a time of the year that the event is happening. Okay. That happens in the future to somebody else's episode so you're not messing with Fall, like going backwards spring, summer yeah. winter you're, you're, not, you're not you're not moving backwards in time you're always moving forward in time um and that that basically makes so you you don't have knowledge about something that hasn't happened yet you have to worry about like time continuum crap that that could uh could mess up your game <laughs> you don't really have to worry about that you know i mean honestly we we talked about time and time is a is a fickle thing and I, I personally love time because here's my thing. The, if you were to do a game, an episode that took place before it and some person got a permanent scar, why don't they have it in, 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 in forward games? My thing is, how can you tell that that's the same timeline? What? <laughs> that's because I love playing with time. Time is my guy. I could sit and talk to you and about time forever. It's about time, I mean, Jared. About time that we said that? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think our listeners are ready for my, my diatribe on how cool time is um, in, in, in all the, the science that goes into it. Because I'm, I'm one of those people who actually reads articles about time. The, get, getting back to it, um, the, the capability of new storytellers is a huge monumental pressure off of me. It, it's great knowing that next game is going to be Aaron's game and I don't have to create a campaign that is going to, you know, set sail off to new ventures and I've got two weeks to do it. That is one of the things that I have always had difficulty with with long-term campaigns is you are setting a campaign, setting characters, NPCs, for a journey that will take years. And the thing is, if you don't end it correctly, if you don't hit new land, all those years, it was like a flop. You gotta have the perfect ending for it. It's gotta end perfectly. Um, I love episodic because I can tell you, I've, I've had games that were good base runs. I've had games that were bunts. Um, I've had games that just, I cracked it out the park that even I sit back and go, oh my God, I story told that. That was mine. Holy shit. I did that? I'm an idiot. You know? So episodic gives that new storyteller. The next advantage is the, um, and Aaron kind of touched on it, which is your biggest problem is, is fatigue of long campaigns. Uh, in episodic storytelling, what I like about it is I can contain themes. So for our Red Lake one, my theme, I, I, I dived into my master of terror. I said, man, I'm, I'm going to scare the crap out of my players so much that, and I don't know if Aaron was just giving me a compliment, that when they walk outside of my house at night, they worry that there's a wind to go out there waiting for them. No, I legitimately was worried at the end of your games. I was looking around and I'm just like, it's too quiet out here. And it was the winter, and it was like everything worked out just perfectly. For that. It was. I mean, like, 
uh, thematically, I had themes of uh, this dying community, um, which is a passion that I'm, I'm very strongly about. Um, you know, I'm going to get on a little soapbox. I'm sorry, Aaron. I'm sorry, listeners. Uh, I'm very passionate about our Native American uh, or First Nation communities and, uh, you know, the lack of opportunities that they have on reservations. If any of you uh, have that sort of excess income or, uh, you know, can help out in any way to our um, First Nation communities or our Native American or Indian communities, however they prefer. Sometimes I actually do prefer the term Indian. Uh, please do. Uh, the, these are struggling communities that have overcome quite a lot. Off of soapbox. Um, sorry, I just, I love, I love First Nation. Uh, First Nation, Indian, Native American communities, I really do. So off of the soapbox, back to it. Um, I contain a theme of, of desperation, of a decaying community, of absolute terror. And it was great. And it ran perfect. The game prior to that, and Aaron might correct me if I'm wrong, was a bunch of crazy, it was a pretty much a, a three session shootout with a bunch of crazed rednecks. Yep. Um, total different theme. One was action, adventure, find the bad guy, kill the bad guy. You know, and, and it was fire and explosions and it was, it was great for what it was. Um, and then my next game is, is terror and, and a dying community and, and our heroes really being heroes. You know, so each one I can focus on a theme and I can engage that theme with all of my focus and I don't have to worry about player fatigue. Like, oh my God, my guys, there it's been six months of terror. We're tired of being scared, Jared. We're tired of being scared. And then my game has the possibility of flopping. When I say it's gonna be seven sessions, I'm running this. Now, some of you might say, well, I run separate stories inside my campaign. Excellent. Episodic storytelling could take the look of a large campaign. Um, I can best describe it to TV shows. Never think of episodic storytelling as the Twilight Zone. Because it's different characters. Well, you could. Uh, different characters, different story each time. There's also episodic storytelling like Buffy the Vampire Slayer. We're talking about an eight-season show, which had a different monster every week had about seasonal through lines, but at the end of every season, they'd have a new through line. Um, and overarching though, you have the same characters, you have reoccurring villains, and that is the type of episodic that I'm looking at, that I, I particularly engage with. And then finally, you have campaign storytelling, which is someone's trying to tell the story of, I mean, like, honestly, you're, you're trying to create a TV show that might have different stories every once in a while, but otherwise you're going over, you know, um, I don't know. I haven't watched any. That's my problem. I don't I watch a whole lot of TV nowadays. <laughs> uh, I, I, but, I understand what you, what you, what you're going for there. And actually the, the listeners do the, uh, the, the, the one thing I caught out of that was, uh, or the one thing I wanted to talk about a little bit more was the through line there, because that's the, that's the, that's the, the, the nice thing about an, an epic campaign or a big campaign is that the through line makes sense. Here is the evil. Here is what we're trying to stop. We know the through line. Okay. The through line makes sense in an episodic game or a game where maybe you're jumping between storytellers. You say, how the hell do I maintain the through line? Okay. Well, so the through line can be maintained by connecting your games uh, with a series of what Jared likes to call breadcrumbs. And that's a way that you can maintain a through line for your game so they all have continuity at the end of your through line. Um, so you're, essentially what you would do is, uh, the way Jared best described this was, you find a rosary, you find a, a crucifix. It was the priest all along. Like every game you find one of those extra pieces, one of those other clues, that give you the, uh, the the full story, the bigger context to it. So you don't have to dump the biggest, baddest monster at the end of your game. You can build up to that monster and have the culmination of experience make the downfall of the monster seem worthwhile at the end of the story. Absolutely. Main through lines and, and the breadcrumbs. This is precisely what I do, and I leave them. The great thing is when I create a through line, I say, okay, I want my through line 
nowadays, I say I want it done in my next five games. At the end of game five is when they meet the big baddie. And then we will move on to my next through line, which is when you, at the end of the next five games. Um, because it gives my characters the complete uh, overarching, as Aaron said, uh, he really hit the nail on the head, the value of taking down this bad guy who's been actually coordinating everything for the last five games. The great thing about episodic storytelling that I, I just am so passionate about nowadays is I can do a five game through line, then three games that have nothing to do with any through lines, which gives me time to think about my next through line, which is the next five games. So right now I've got 13 different games set up kind of like, okay, here's my first through line. That was a brilliant idea, Jared. Give myself some head pats. Like, oh man, you're so smart. You're so smart. I'm like, no, I'm still an idiot. But then I do my three games that have nothing to do with that or anything. Why? Because I need to develop my next through line. I need some time. I need, I need a little bit of breakage. And then I can move into my next through line. And it has worked out very cool. Very, 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 very cool. When, it, when you start looking at those through lines, remember, breadcrumbs, the nice thing is, is that if a through line isn't going to work, so you get to the almost like, okay, I want to do this in five games, and you're at game four, and you're like, I still haven't developed this. The nice thing about breadcrumbs is, is that the trail can go cold. The players can go off into other adventures. But that trail can be picked up later when, one, it makes more sense, or two, when you're ready to engage it, or simply the trail ends. Okay, so we found a rosary and a Bible, and, uh, you know, we also found, um, you know, a relic in, in three games. I wonder what that means. Keep your characters, keep your characters on the hook. You're, I, I love looking at my players and going, I don't know, what do you think it means? <laughs> I love doing that. Um, I want to return to it. I always want to go back to it, but you know, um, if I can't execute on it, I will let it sit on what Aaron and I affectionately call the back burner um, and, and just let it simmer. And maybe I'll sprinkle more breadcrumbs in uh, along the way. So the through line is very cool. You don't have to have a through line in episodic storytelling. You don't nece necessarily have to do it. You know, I, if you look a la, Mm, Buffy really had, you know, um, in, in, uh, in any major syndicated TV show, you think about House or like you know Bones or you know. I'm just there. You I'm go House. I'm, I'm, th I'm throwing out a couple of them. You know, of a 26 episode season, I don't remember how long the, the seasons were, but you'd have maybe six of those that were the main through line, and the other 20 episodes were just you know, flavor of the day, completely unrelated. Had they not existed, you lose nothing from the, in, the through line that you put together. Uh, for example, you bring up a great point, the house. House. Um, I remember one season that they really described this, this cop going after him for his drug problem. That was one season. I think the cop and that probably engaged in six episodes. The other 20 episodes, it might have been a, hey, is house still being investigated? Yeah, okay. Let's move on to the disease person. The through line was accomplished in six episodes. The other 20 episodes had nothing to do with it. Um, so that's really episodic storytelling gives you just such a huge advantage in that. The next one is new villain. It, it, it lets you get your creative on. I feel with campaign, you've got a set list of villains. This is gonna be my big bad guy at the very, very end of the campaign. And I've got to predict that they will defeat him in, you know, 18 months down the road. That's asking a lot. And I feel like it's a lot of undue anxiety and pressure on the storytelling. You know, it really is. And, and please take our 20 plus years of experience. And I can tell you how freeing as a storyteller it is to walk away from the idea of campaign setting game because now i can build my little through lines i've got aaron's storytelling i've got ken's storytelling i got brian's storytelling and i can build my little ideas i can theme them out i can build my villain and i and i'm i'm ready for next week and that's really in episodic that's really where we started coming into the ideas of i'm not starting this game until it's done 
until I'm putting icing on the sides and putting a cherry on the top. I'm not starting. And, you know, for example, uh, I've had games where literally I had icing on the sides, I put the cherry on the top, and it wasn't my turn yet. You know, Ken had to run a game. All right, well, I got two options at that point. I could work on the game after that, or I can continue putting on more icing and making my cake more decorative. I generally choose to make my cake more decorative um, just because I really want that full spectrum experience uh, for all my players. I really want to create an amazing moment. Um, sometimes you won't have time. Sometimes you'll barely get that cherry on. You're going to be like, eh, out the door. Um, but other times you're, you're not going to have that. So, um, really, um, yeah, it, it's, it's, um, uh, the, the new villains is, is really great because it gives your characters that capability to, or characters, your players, that capability to fight somebody new, fight something interesting, whether or not that be uh, a slave owning count whether it be an Alliance battle cruiser that has been plaguing the system for the last few weeks, it gives your character something new to fight. Um, you know, and instead of trying to create Star Wars, which was years over years over years, you're instead trying to go for the Buffy monster. Um, and, and really, it's kind of hilarious that Buffy is our, is our big... So like, like it's, well, it, 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 fit, it fits into the, into the thematic theme that we sort of have right now with our games, which is we're is sort true. of dealing we're sort of dealing with Buffy type monsters. Uh, but I mean yes. the yes. what? Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I think you get you, you you brought up a good point, which is you get to to experiment and play with different villains, different creatures, um, you know, di 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 just different obstacles for your players to overcome. You get to experiment with different, um, you know, themes and uh, feels for your game, uh, whether they're going to be fast and loose or they're going to be uh, very concise mysteries and whatnot. And it's just easy to compartmentalize two or three games and being like, I'm going to make sure these are really tight and they feel really good and the players can follow through everything that I'm going to do. Um, whereas when you had that big campaign, uh, in the past, it was always like um, it was always like you wanted to uh, expand. You, you, you're you're tr you're trying to head your players off at the pass. It's it's it, like I said, we we've talked about it in the past. It's almost impossible to build out every inch of a long campaign and then execute it. You can only really do so much. It's kind of, it, they're, they're almost like two different writing styles in and of themselves. Um, and I think the mo one of the other things, one of the things I wanted to touch on with the with this, the the episodic game is being that they're so tight, you really have to stick to these little mini gatherings. Like, what brought you to this moment here at this episode? And you have to end every single one of those. The endings always feel pretty good at the end of them. And like Jared said, it's not this big flop at the end of a big campaign where you go like. Uh, what happened? Like two and a half <laughs> years, my ending's a flop. Yeah, I mean, but like, was, like was... play, players love that game. You loved your characters, and at the end of the game, it just you just couldn't stick the landing. You get you get more attempts to stick the landing, which means that you end up with a bunch of games that can be home runs, and you end up with a bunch of games that are are more uh, just good games. L baseline hits. Yeah, you know. Even if that if is that a baseball term, baseline hit, base hit, base hit, base hit, yeah, a <laughs> yeah, base hit, single, double, triple. We 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 know some we know some things. <laughs> I'm going to be learning a lot more in the future, but um, so you know, it 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 really is, and you know, one of the one of the things that I also like about episodic storytelling, one of the other advantages is change in location. In the larger campaigns there is a trouble with what I call travel time, especially for you D&D uh, DMs. Oh my God. I have, I have, God bless you. I have tried to calculate like, okay, a horse travels approximately this uh, many miles in a single day before it needs rest and hay and, and yada yada. So this trip will take them approximately one month. And I'm like, one month? What the hell happens on a road in a month? Nothing. Oh, they get hit by bandits. 
How many times? You got 30 freaking days. How many people are haunting this road looking to get robbed? Nobody used the road then. Go find other paths. Okay, off my soapbox. But God bless you, you DMs that are just like, yeah, a horse travels for approximately 36 miles a day. Let me get out my pen and do some quick math. I don't have a brain for math. That's why we have Brian, who's, who's a walking, living calculator. God bless his math capabilities. In an episodic, you guys are in the city of Kaluf in the, in the sandy deserts where the wind blows hot and sweat from your brow drips into your eyes, stinging you just as the sun hits. Next month or next episode, you're in the cold, dark, frigid north. How'd you get there? We don't care. It was a long, boring wagon ride. Okay. Um, especially when it comes down to space travel. Space travel for you sci-fi uh, players out there, because my heart is with you guys. I, I am myself a sci-fi guy. Star Trek, yes. Technically, warp speed has has given the Federation the capability to go incredibly far, incredibly fast. But the Delta Quadrant still takes a while to get there it zips ahead time. Because one of the things that I will warn you storytellers who are like, no, I do the road and I do the minutia of, okay, well, the uh, warp coil is, you know, kind of broke. They know every time that you mention that something on the road happened, it's going to be bad. It's, you're never stopping them for a good thing. You're stopping them to increase. And this is, this is part of narrative storytelling. This is part of narrative writing you are stopping them to create conflict. Conflict leads to drama. Drama leads to fun times. Nobody wants to tell the story about, well, I pooped today. And I sat around and watched Netflix and uh, made dinner. You know, like <laughs> nobody wants that. No, it, we all role play so we can get away from that for a couple of hours and be adventurers and barbarians and Jedis and and Jedi, well, Jedi, plural, Jedi, just Jedi, yeah, or Jedi, or Starfleet officers, or, uh, you know, mobsters, gangsters, um, we, that's, that's why we come to the game, so I love flipping ahead on episode, episodic, and I can just take you from one place to another place that is exotic, and fun, and welcomes my players to explore, um, you know, We've spent seven games down in the deserts. Now we're going to spend three games up north, and they've never been north before. And it skips the road. Skip the road. Because trust me, the road is boring. Get rid of it. If you're doing it, because, and God bless you, because um, most of you will probably come back and say, well, Matt Mercer does. Yeah, Matt Mercer, the guy storytells for a living. He gets paid to do that I don't have time I got a wife I got a job I got friends he literally for eight hours a day could still do all the things that I do where he says I've got a job I've got work or I've got a job I've got a wife I've got friends but for eight hours his job literally is storytelling he gets to sit down and be like let's figure this bitch out you know and that's a pen click in case anyone was wondering and he can do that. And Matt Mercer is just, his, his capability of storytelling is absolutely amazing. Um, his level of writing is absolutely amazing and, and, and hats off to him. But right now that is his job. And he has a main freaking talent that is, that is hard to, to grasp. Um, but again, the guys in theater and acting and, and, and all that stuff, and I'm not gonna get into that. I'm not Matt Mercer. What? What? <laughs> I'm not Matt Mercer. Um, unfortunately, I did not go the path where I thought that, you know, role-playing would be my, my – because if, if I can make role-playing my source of income, trust me, I would do it in a heartbeat. But I can't. Um, you know, I work in training, and I have to travel and, and, and stuff like that. But break away from that. If you want to try to take on the road, knock yourself out. God bless you. Take, you're taking on the challenge. You want to switch to episodic storytelling? 
suddenly the road does not seem so long. And 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 that's really where it comes down to. The road is not so long in episodic storytelling. And and you can really detail up that road, the parts where you're stopping. Um, kind of my last thought. Uh, and I guess it's going to, Aaron, do you have any final thoughts before I'm moving to my last thought? No, no, I was actually going to ask if you had anything else because I thought that was sort of beautiful, but I'll let you hit your last thought. <laughs> tools. I started to sit down and I said, okay, what, what tools do you need? What tools do you, can I give you? The only tool that I could really give you was good notes. Take good notes. But the other tool that I could give you was when you're sharing, have those notes so you can share with the other storytellers. And that is what's going to lead us into next week when we are talking about collaborative storytelling, which has just changed our world 20 years upside down. Had we known this when we were 12, we would have been make, cranking out much better games. We probably wouldn't have executed it very well, but... Okay, when we were 17, we probably would have executed it pretty well. Touche, that one I'll give you. Um, all I'm saying is we're going to save you a lot of pain, a lot of heartbreak, and we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna show you a, a whole new world um, in collaborative storytelling. So uh, that's all I've got for this week. Aaron? I'm all good. So with that, uh, if you want to get a hold of us, give us feedback, uh, recommend or suggest a topic that you'd like us to talk about. Uh, contact us at levelupyourgamingpodcast at gmail.com. Otherwise, for Jared, I'm Aaron. Have a good week, guys. Have a great week, everyone.